Okay, we're going to get into your last unit now on measuring of intelligence. Um, this is your last presentation or last video um, before we get ready for the test. So hopefully you've been going through the videos, you got everything up to date on that, you got all your notes filled out to help you prepare for the test. Um, you got, you know, we've gone through chapter seven questions now. You should be getting finished up with chapter eight questions off of the uh, worksheet that was on your Dropbox. You've taken a quiz. We've been watching the video on Battle of the Brains and doing some of the activities in class. So all of that is now coming all together here to get you ready for your final uh, for the test. And hopefully you're getting yourself pretty well prepared for that. Okay, so to finish up this unit on intelligence, what we're going to get into then is how do we measure intelligence. And then we're going to get into a little bit more into intricacy into some of the different kinds of intelligences that there are. So... How do you measure it is basically it all got started a hundred years ago with Alfred uh, Binet. He was the guy that created the uh, first measurement intelligence test in 1904. Uh, you might want to make sure you circle there Binet or make sure you get his name underlined. Pretty important for the test. Uh, he created a device to help measure uh, dealing with subnormal children. What basically happened is in France they uh, had passed a law back in 1904 that every child in France had to go to school. So now the school system was freaking out trying to figure out okay what are we going to do with all these kids and how are we going to put them in classes and how are we going to place them and what are we going to do. So they went to Binet and said hey can you come up with a inexpensive easy to administer test that would be able to predict children's performances in school so that we could adequately separate them out. And he did that. He created this great test and, and basically we've been using this test since and it's known as basically the IQ test. Uh, Binet then, along with Theodore Simon, who was his aide, created this test. They called it the General Mental Abilities Test. It was created in 1905. It wasn't expensive and it basically did its job. It was able to help to administer to the school districts how to best get the kids uh, objectively assigned to where they need to be placed at uh, in dealing with their intelligence's ability then. And Binet, the Binet Simon scale that was created basically took and looked at what was known as the mental level or mental age of the child. The mental age is indicated when he or she displays a mental ability typical of that child's age. In other words, if you take the test and you are 15 years old, let's say, and you took the test, you should be able to score at an average age of a 15-year-old. And so the Binet Simon scale then had a representation of who, what you should score at as a typical 15-year-old child. If you scored above that, then you were considered to be higher intelligence, below that, lesser intelligence. And that was basically how it was set up. The problem with the scale was it wasn't very well administered and it really didn't have a lot of scientific backing to it. So, a little bit later, in 1916, two guys by the name of Lewis Terman, and again, that's a name you want to make sure you get down, uh, at the University of Stanford uh, came up with a new scale. And basically, along with his team, they created what was known as the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. Basically, the test is still the same test that Binet came up with, but the scale is different. Now they came up with what was known as intelligence quotients. Okay, IQ in other words. And basically this is the child's mental ability, mental age, okay, divided by the chronological age, which would then be multiplied by 100 to get your percent score. So again, if you had a child who was, let's say, at 8 years old, and they took this test, and they scored as a 12-year-old would score on the test, then you would divide that mental age, which in this case is going to be the child's 12 years of mental age. His chronological age would be 8. You divide that into each other, and he's going to end up having a score somewhere around the neighborhood of 140 IQ, which would be extremely high, gifted intelligence, okay, uh, or genius intelligence, basically. Then what they did is they took the scale, and they basically then laid it out on what was known as a bell curve and we're going to get into a little bit more about that tomorrow when we uh, kind of go over it in class. Okay, the next big question dealing with intelligence then, once they figured out the scale and figured out, okay, this is based on how intelligence is set up and, and we now talked about what exactly is the constitutes intelligence, where does it come from? That's something that psychologists have been perplexed with for many, many years. And the video we're watching, Battle of the Brain, talks about this, and we'll get into it even more. But basically the idea about where does this whole thing come from is if it is heredity. Let's say that your intelligence is 80% heredity. Okay, It comes from your parents and your grandparents. Okay, And the combination 
of your parents and grandparents makes up your intelligence. And let's say 80% comes from intelligence. Of uh, your intelligence comes from that. Well, what that means then is really when it comes to schools and, and when it comes to learning, uh, there wouldn't be a need to put a lot of emphasis in uh, in trying to improve on your intelligence to try to make it greater because if it's already a set thing and you're in environmentally locked in kind of like your hair color or your eye color or your height or your weight is set by heredity then basically you know trying to improve on that is not going to work very well when it comes to schools if however environment okay how you are taught, where you are taught, all of those factors that comes into the environmental part of it is more important than the heredity, than the genetic part, then schools would play a huge role because the greater the schools, the better your teachers, the, the more time you have with the resources and programs, being able to help improve your education, you could expand on and grow your intelligence exponentially and get take someone who's in maybe a 90 IQ and pull them up to 150 if environment was the key. What psychologists have been able to so far determine is they believe that heredity is about 60 percent, environment's about 40 percent. Now boy, you get different psychologists arguing different things here, but that's kind of where the set is at right now. How do they know this? So, you know, how do they do these studies to figure out where the IQ is in terms of your heredity environment? There's a lot of studies out there, but we're just going to really quickly run through a couple of them. One of the things they look at is what's known as the twin studies. Okay, and when they're studying twins, the two types of twins that basically psychologists are looking at is your identical twins and the fraternal twins. Now, remember, fraternal twins are twins that are born together. Okay, not necessarily at the exact same time, but relatively within the same time period, within a very short period of time there. But they are they're from two separate eggs, two individual sperms. So in other words, they're no different. They're only 50% identical to each other. No different than your brother and sister. If you were born six years apart, you're 50% the same. Same as fraternal. So not a whole lot, no big change here. Identical twins, 100% identical. They're from one egg, one sperm that has split, divided. and But yet the DNA, the genetics of that, of that sperm and egg are identically the same. So here is where the fascination comes in, is when you're studying these types of twins, where is the correlation when it comes to intelligence? Well, what they've discovered is that identical twins have an exceptionally high correlation uh, of intelligence. Even those twins who are raised apart, now that's the key. So to put this together is what you got is you got these twins, okay, let's say that they're identical twins and they were separated at birth maybe the mother gave them up for adoption one goes off and lives over in New York another one lives on a farm in Iowa okay with different families different environments they're raised totally separate and not knowing then what they did in psychology studies is they were able to find these twins through birth records and other things bring them back together and they would be able to test their intelligences now if intelligence is heredity, then the two twins should have virtually identical intelligences. Even though they're raised totally separate from each other, it doesn't matter if it's identical. They're 100% the same genetically, so their intelligence should be the same. If it's environmental that plays the biggest role in intelligence, then there should be a vast difference in their intelligences because they were raised so separately and so individually. What they've discovered time and time again in these studies is that there is a high correlation, not an exact, not an exact, that's important here, there isn't 100%. But there was a high correlation of the intelligence scores that were relatively close. So what does that mean? Is that, yes, genetics plays a bigger role than environment when it comes to your intelligence. How much so? That's where that 60-40 comes in. Others argue 70-30, but there is, a, there is a difference there. Another one they look at is adoptive studies. And here again, they found a very good correlation between non-biological parents and the intelligence of their child that they're raising. So if you have an adoptive child and they are not biologically related to that adoptive parent at all, but what they've discovered is in their studies, in the intelligence studies, is that that adopted child, their intelligence scores are relatively close, not exact but close to that of the non-biological parent okay now when they look at the biological parent who has not raised the child whatsoever 
not been in contact with the child, and they look at the intelligence scores there, there's even a higher correlation there uh, over the non-biological parent. So again, it shows that the genetics does play a major role. Okay, another big factor when it comes to intelligence is what's known as the Flynn study. And this was done over the series of long-term years in which what this study has been able to show is through military testing IQ scores because the military has been testing scores since way back in World War I. So if you go from World War I, which was in the early 1900s, to today, which is almost, almost 100 years there together, what they have found is those scores, those IQ scores of the military personnel has gone up, not just in the United States, but across the world. So we are getting smarter. Our, our IQs are getting higher over the set of years. Um, why is that? What, what's the reasoning behind that? There's a lot of factors that psychologists have argued here. There's such things as dealing with uh, health issues. The fact that we are supposedly healthier because we have medicines and better doctors and better health care and those kinds of things that has improved our intelligence scores. Another big argument that you can re argue why the scores have gotten better is because schools have improved. Parenting has improved. A lot of different different factors goes into this but what they've shown is that our IQ scores are rising as a whole now again that's as a whole of a country and as an as a world um, when you look at the individual scores here in the United States they've kind of leveled off over the years and that's a problem here as to why our scores are not improving as compared to other countries and we're gonna get more into that when we get back in the class Sandra Scar is another psychologist who went, you want to make sure you get her name down. She argues, okay, the fact that heredity does play a role. She wanted to look at the environmental role and how does environment move our intelligence. And what she discovered is that we have what's called a reaction range when it comes to the environment and our intelligence. And she said that there is an intelligent limit on how much the environment can play a role in improving our intelligence. She argues that it's about 20 to 25 points on an IQ scale. So in other words, if you have a good school, if you have good parenting, if you have good nutrition, all of those factors comes into play here, you can actually raise your IQ score from what your parents gave you heredity wise you can improve it by about 20 to 25 points. On the other side, if you're in a poor environment, poor parenting, poor in nutrition, poor schools, poor education, you could decrease, you could lower your IQ score, you could get dumber because of the bad environment you're in by 20 to 25 points. Fascinating study on that. All right, the last one to look at here is the uh, Hernstein uh, and Murray book called The Bell Curve. And this played a big role in the 19, back in the 1990s, 1980s, and 2000, because they basically came out and said that based upon this concept of heredity, that minorities, blacks, Hispanics especially, can't fight the fact that their genetics, their heredity, is lower than that of whites. And so basically their argument was that minorities are not as smart as whites because they do not have the genetic makeup of superiority to what the whites are. This caused a big backlash. Now the problem was that there was a lot of statistics to this and so there was a lot of argument going on that hey we have the statistics to prove that minorities are just not as smart as whites. Well the problem comes into the fact that they didn't study the correct data and again we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get back into class then. Okay, the last two things, and, and really the one here on multiple intelligence dealing with Gardner and the other one dealing with Sternberg here on dealing with creative intelligence and practical intelligence, we're going to talk about in class. I just wanted to kind of real quickly run into these and make sure you get them. But and also the video talks a lot about Sternberg's theory, uh, which is known as the triarchic theory of human intelligence, where she talks about the three key parts here, analytical, creative, and practical. And again, in class, we're going to run through these a little bit more but basically this is where it gets into the idea that we're not intelligence is not just textbook intelligence it's not just how well you do being able to do math problems or science problems or read a problem and come up with the answer that's all analytical and Sternberg agrees that that's important but he's also going to talk about these other two as two key important types of intelligences creative and practical the other person who you want to make sure you know about for the test is going to be Gardner. And we're going to talk a little bit more about him in class. But basically he says that there are eight 
types of intelligence, known as the eight multiple intelligence here. And you can kind of see the eight going around this uh, circle here. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about these and kind of talk about uh, what exactly was Gardner getting into here when he get into this eight multiple intelligences then. So that pretty much gets us through the videos then and uh, the presentations that you're going to need to know for the test. And we'll finish up everything else in class tomorrow.